Welcome to our Big Book 12-step workshop. Please join me in the set-aside prayer. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and you. For an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We're crossing over. In step one, there's a dash. Admitted we were powerless over alcohol. We've spent several workshops looking at the two component parts of that first half of the first step to deal with addiction. Simply put, I observe that I cannot stop when I start. The doctor's opinion says, it looks like an allergy. I call it a craving that biochemical reaction, that biological reaction that is triggered by the consumption of alcohol. <clears throat> that was his experience. His vision was completely focused on alcohol as a problem. As a psychiatrist, he also knew there were other problems and speculated about that. In fact, his words say that there's a problem with the body and a problem with the mind. But he spent all his time talking to us about the problem of the body. Almost no time talking about the problem of the mind, referring to it, but never really expanding his comment on that. When I start, I cannot stop. One of the signals that we might have an addiction and I say might because it could just be a bad habit, an unhealthy neurotic response to coping with your untenable situations. That's for you to decide. Bill says if that was the problem, then stop and stay stopped. And the problem is we can't stop and stay stopped. So Bill elaborates on the problem of the mind. He uses the terms obsession and delusion as an explanation for the inability to stop once we've stopped. We have lots of experience stopping and unfortunately lots of experience of starting again. We've explored that and I've asked you to personally explore it in your own history using the body worksheet and the mind worksheet. You have some information. I hope you had an experience with it. That's my prayer. Certainly that you got some information, but more especially that you had some experience with it. Remembering the particular incidences surrounding your addiction, not stopping and not staying stopped. This is the way Bill starts in unpacking unmanageability by my standards today, the beginning of chapter four, we agnostics. It's clear from the structure of the big book and Bill's approach that he did not intend to start looking at unmanageability in chapter four. He felt at the conclusion of chapter three, page 43, that he had done sufficient commentary and instruction on step one. It's clear the structure of the book. 
The alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. His defense must come from a higher power. Then he goes into finding a higher power. He goes into transitioning into step two. That's the structure of the book. I believe that's his intention in the way he has approached his step methodology and his commentary and instructions. The first two times I went through the steps, this man, these men followed that. Exactly. At this point, we entered into a discussion about step two. But not the third time. The third time I went through the steps at 10 years of sobriety, 1994. I was not coming with a problem. I had come to it. AA with a problem of drinking. That's what I thought my problem was. Drinking. I didn't know about alcoholism and addiction, but I knew I had trouble. So I went to AA. I stopped drinking first, then I went to AA. At four years of sobriety, I had an experience by learning the doctor's opinion that in fact, that was in fact part of my problem. Once I start, I cannot stop. Three years later, I did the work again with another step guide, very knowledgeable mechanics with the, with the big book and the step process. And I had that second experience that I've talked about before in terms of the problem of the mind. Each time those men took me into step two. They didn't know that they didn't know. Obviously, I didn't know that they didn't know. None of that prevented me from having consecutive spiritual awakenings in 1988 and 1991. I'm saying this really to impress upon you the nature of process, not event, of experience, not knowledge, of an awakening, not a task, slow. This third time, as I've mentioned previously, but this is a good context for the big picture, this man introduced me to the set aside attitude because he knew I had a lot of information and a lot of experience. He suggested that I pray set aside prayer every day and any time I sat down to do the work. He took me through those first two parts it was interesting, but not revealing, confirming, no new experience. But then he began unmanageability as a completely separate issue in step one. These are the instructions now contained in assignment five. I've given you half of them for today, the other half, actually, for next week. In assignment five, I had you take a look at pages 44 and 45. Numbers one, two, and three from assignment five. Some definitions and the reading of 44 and 45 and 52. For next week, I want you to do Numbers four and five, that is, go now to chapter five and read pages 60 to 62. And follow the directions with regard to the bedevilment if you haven't done that already. And even if you have, do it over again. Read it. I'll get more specific about that when I come to it today. The balance of the instructions for assignment five, I'm going to give you to next week so that we will have then completed it. On page 45, Bill starts out warming us up like I just did, giving a context, standing on the step process on the path where we're at 
by the time we get to chapter four at the conclusion of page 43, stopping, pausing, and looking back over our shoulder. This is exactly what I just did. I learned it from Bill. I learned it from the structure of the big book. Every time we sit down to take a look back over where we've been, where we are, and possibly a little bit about where we're going. So we have a context. In the preceding chapters, page 44, you have learned something of alcoholism. We are making clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. We're not talking about people with a bad habit. We're not talking about people with unhealthy behavior. We're talking about people who literally have no choice, biochemically, biologically, and psychologically, emotionally. And he, can, and he confirms it here. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, well, obviously that's the problem of the mind. Or, notice he doesn't say and. Pay attention to the way Bill writes. It's very intentional. Either or, one or the other. If when drinking, you have little control, clearly a, a problem of the, bo the body, the uh, allergy. He makes a big leap though. He calls it an illness, which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Because he's coming from the Oxford group, assumptions. You may or may not at this point agree with the spiritual experience or the spiritual awakening necessity. That's okay, doesn't matter. And that's what he dedicates chapter four to. He calls it we agnostics. To one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic. You may have looked up those terms. I don't believe I asked you in the instructions to do that because we're not at step two. But just because it's in this text here, I'll, I'll define it. It comes from the Greek words, atheist, the Greek word is theos, meaning God, the divine, the sacred, whatever that reality is, that's the symbol for it, theos. And when you put an A in front of it, it means it's a negative, not, not God. An atheist firmly believes there is no God. Whereas agnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, the G is silent, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, which means knowledge. And when you put an A in front of it, it means no knowledge or doubt. There may or may not be a God. We don't know that and we doubt it. The difference is an atheist has a firm conviction there is no reality other than material reality. An agnostic says, hmm, don't know, don't care, really doubt. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis. These are not always easy alternatives. He's saying you're at the fork in the road. He says it many times. It's a mental image he gives us many times. We're at the fork in the road. Left turn means long-term pain and death and suffering. Right turn means short-term pain long-term recovery and happiness. You choose, you choose. You're at the fork in the road. Here in step two, he is saying that. He says half of the people who came to the fellowship when he was writing this book in 1939 are either agnostic or atheist. He's just not a problem. Don't sweat it, not a problem. We'll deal with it when we get to step two. I'm not going to deal with it right now. But he does say we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual uh, uh, basis for life or else. He doesn't tell us what else. What do you think he might mean by that? I mean death. Suffer and die. Then he goes on in the bottom of that page. He talks about a code of morals and a better philosophy of life. Again, pause. What does he mean? 
Bill's using a couple phrases. Obviously, they're different implications. What does he mean by this in 1939? A code of morals. Okay, that's a code of behavior. Morals are a sense of values translated into ethics and behavior. Mm, Ten Commandments would be a good example of that. I'm not endorsing the Ten Commandments. I'm merely saying that's an example of the code of morals. A uh, better philosophy of life. Oh, that's knowledge. Code of morals is about behavior. No, philosophy is about knowledge. If these were sufficient to overcome our addiction, most of us would have recovered long ago. We've had lots of information and knowledge. We've had lots of exposure to religious traditions and psychological therapy. We have found such codes and philosophies did not save us no matter how much we tried. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. We could wish to do better. We could wish to know better. Many times we know better, but don't do better. Many times we don't do better because we don't know better. Now here's the transition as I see it. This is my interpretation. We could will these things with all our might. Oh, Dr. Silkworth talked about the body and the mind. Bill talked about the body and the mind. But now Bill is giving us a new component. That essential component that makes us specifically human, our free will. And he is saying, our free will is not free. We could will these things with all our might, but the needed power isn't there, the needed willpower. Our human resources, perhaps body and mind, as marshaled by the will, that function in us that determines our compliance with law, common sense, they're not sufficient. He said they failed utterly. You see how now it comes under the category and the umbrella of powerless in step one. Lack of power is my dilemma, not addiction. Addiction's a problem. It's just not the problem. Now, Bill is, of course, introducing us to step two here. I'll close the comment on that by his own comments, we had to find a power by which we could live. Notice not by which we could deal with effectively with our addiction, by which we could live, manage our lives, deal with reality. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously, but where and how are we going to find this power? Wonderful, basic, curtain parting questions at the beginning of step two which we'll leave here. Where and how are we going to find this power that is our life depends on? Well, he says, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable me to find a power greater than myself, which will solve my problem. My problem not being addiction, my problem being lack of power. That unmanageability that he refers to in the step, he hasn't used that term, but he has warmed us up to it. And this was the insight of this third man who took me through the steps. He had a much different perspective on the process of step one than even Bill had. And he packaged it differently as I am now doing for you. And he went then immediately to page 52. That second paragraph. What does that unmanageability look like behaviorally. We had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems this same readiness to change our point of view. Wow, sounds very resonant with the set-aside attitude and the set-aside prayer, doesn't it? A readiness to change my point of view, open mind, open heart. Then he digs in. 
we are having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. Uh, we ha were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. We're not the basic solution to these bedevilments more important than lunar flight. Well, lunar flight was on the mind of everybody in 1939. It's old music to us, of course. I believe it was 1964, we actually flew to the moon and walked on it. That was several years after 1939, right? 25 years, actually. But let's focus on what Bill's trying to tell us here. Bedevilments, and I had you look that word up. That's the key to this assignment. We'll talk to you about that when we get there. My definition, the one I like the most, is to be controlled as if by devils. I don't mean it in any religious sense. I meant it poetically, metaphorically. To be controlled as if by devils. I'm a puppet on strings of circumstances and events and people. That I went into this work, 10 years sober, still with that impression. But this man didn't leave a reading and highlighting of that paragraph like I just read it and highlighted it. He said, now, once you've read it and highlighted it, go back and cross out the we and put it, make it personal. Cross out the past tense, had, and make it present and do that throughout the paragraph and then read it out loud. That's your assignment. I hope you did it. If you didn't, I hope you will do it between now and next week. In fact, this man had me do that and then read it out loud twice, consecutively. In reading it, I could see that this was a behavioral description of unmanageability. A wonderful, accurate, specific, description of unmanageability behavior. This is what it looks like. And then when I converted the words to personal pronoun and present tense and read it out loud, I had a wow, brand new experience, a technicolor experience at 10 years of sobriety. I am having trouble with personal relationships. At 10 years of sobriety, 25 years married, I wanted a divorce. I can't control my emotional natures. I had moments of a little depression and a, and a lot of anger. Despite all of the work I had done in therapy and despite all of the previous two spiritual awakenings, I was still meeting major speed bumps in my life. I am a prey to misery and depression. By that time, that wasn't actually that true. My life was pretty even. I've got a fairly positive and energetic personality. It's not my fault. It's a genetic predisposition. So that actually wasn't as applicable as some of the others are. I can't make a living. And I challenged that. Wait, I'm a professional. I have a wonderful career. I'm with a firm for a long time. And I'm a ranking officer of a public company and I make a decent amount of money. How does that apply to me? I said, I took it into meditation. And I got quiet. How does this apply to me? I can't make a living. And I got quiet and the wee small voice said, you can't make a living that satisfies you, Herb, because you're never satisfied. You're a bottomless pit, you're a black hole. There's never enough money or power or prestige or recognition or accolades or pleasure, is there? Wow. That was a very powerful experience because I knew that that was true. In my drinking days, I had prided myself on having a mantra, never enough. I thought that was 
a modern current attitude. Something to be proud of. Once I had done the work of the fourth and fifth step, I saw how arbitrary and unhealthy that is. Very materialistic to the extent that I had adopted it. I have a feeling of uselessness. Eh, not so much. I had kind of low self-esteem still at that point. And that might have been correlated with there's never enough to make me feel whole, to make me feel healthy, to make me feel a part of, to make me feel normal. I think that was all correlated. I was in therapy at the time dealing with all of that restless, irritable, and discontent because that had not been removed at the level that I knew it could be removed by the prior step work. I am full of fear. Not so much. I wasn't aware enough to be full of fear. My arrogance and my hubris pride probably were the mask that shielded me from the real feelings of fear and reality. I am unhappy only in the sense that um, I, I didn't feel that I fit in any place and that uh, I was married to the wrong woman. <laughs> Those might be kind of major. I almost threw them away in my, my caricature of them right now. I can't seem to be of real help to other people. I said, wait a minute, how does that apply to me? You've heard my story, at least the Reader's Digest version of it. I took it into meditation. I can't seem to be of real help to other people. My God, I spent the first seven years of my young adult life in a monastery, all about becoming a missionary Catholic priest to help other people. I left for many reasons. Then I tried to become a psychologist with all the trappings of what you do to knowledge and therapy experiences to become a effective therapist. And I changed that, but that was all about helping people. I still had the delusion that that was true. And I did the self-help things of the 60s and the 70s, and I now am an AA. And because of the work I've done in the steps up to this point, I'm being asked to help a lot of people in sponsorship. So how does this apply to me? I can't be of real help to other people. And I got quiet. And someplace in there, I could hear this wee, 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 wee whisper. Herb, <clears throat> you don't really want to help people. You want the reputation of helping people. What a powerful, powerful insight that was. Embarrassing, but startling. All of that time, and I had enough now step four and step five experience from the prior journeys, that the, all of the dots were connected. The puzzle pieces were put in place. I wanted to be a priest for prestige in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. That was still a very high career for a Catholic young boy. I wanted to be a psychologist because of the money and the prestige that came with that. I wanted all of that self-help in order to be powerful, to be able to control and dominate people. And I was in AA sponsoring people because that way I'm eventually going to be elected president of AA. Tongue in cheek, of course. But I saw the truth. And in, in good fortune, I was in therapy at the same time. And I was talking to my therapist about this very thing and giving, sharing with him my startling uh, awareness of my delusions concerning my original motivations. And he just got a big grin on his face. Those of you who have some exposure to me, know that I do a lot of work with Dr. Alan Berger. He's a clinical psychologist at that time. 
he early 90s he was my therapist and uh, for the last 20 years he's been my partner in presenting work on emotional sobriety but at that time he, he stood up he went over to his bookshelf and he took his diagnostic manual off of the bookshelf opened it up like this to a page and took a page out and put it on the photocopy machine and then he gave me the photocopy machine and he said read those nine characteristics these are nine characteristics of the narcissistic personality disorder number one an exaggerated sense of self-importance number two a preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success number three belief in being special four excessive requiring excessive admiration five there's nine a sense of entitlement six selfishness and taking advantage of others to achieve their own ends seven lacking empathy eight envy of others or belief that others envy them nine behaviors or attitudes that are arrogant haughty patronizing or contemptuous he said the only thing missing from the diagnostic manual is your picture it was yeah we we both laughed at that as i hope you are that's from the area in the way of life document on step six if you're interested in seeing i only read the the summaries of it there's more material there if you're interested he said and this is really my point he said it's irreversible and it's not treatable by therapy and medication i said well how, how bad is it he said, well, on a scale of one to 10, you're a seven and a half, and we put tens in the mental asylum or prison. I go, whoa, it's pretty serious then. He said, yes. And we concluded our therapy over time, but I concluded this work over a two-year period. And uh, a few years later, probably 10, I said, do you remember 10 years ago that uh, experience of the narcissistic personality disorder a scale of one to ten seven and a half he said yes i said so based on your current knowledge of me what would you say on the scale of one to ten he said probably about a two and a half because the work that you've done in the big book and with the step process and your consistent practice of meditation and helping other people has invited the spirit to smooth off the edges. How do you get here from there? Grace, really. Certainly a lot of work and a lot of action. And I don't say that at all to impress you with me. I say that to impress you with this work and the process and its effectiveness. Perhaps some of you could relate to all or some of that nine characteristics of a twisted personality. It may or may not apply to you. The hope and the promise is though, that doing this work will have its way with you and bring healing into your life as it has brought into mine. As I mentioned, the assignment for next week is the balance of the reading pages 60 to 62 and on page uh, 63 excuse me page 62 <clears throat> bill confirms the conclusion of the approach to unmanageability for step one it wasn't his intention to structure it this way, but look at the parallel between the way he concluded the first half of the first step on page 43, no effective mental defense against the first drink, no effective mental defense against the first drink, we had to find God. And here on page 62, at the end of the second paragraph, he said, neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power wishing or trying on our own power, just like he did on page 45. 
a lack of willpower. Our willpower is ineffective. In fact, he says we're powerless. We had to have God's help. Not only can we not get rid of our selfishness and self-centeredness, we can't even reduce it much by wishing or trying on our own power, even through the steps. We can do the steps, and we can hope for the miracle. That connection of willingness and action on our part and God's grace. He says we had to have God's help. Now that's the launching pad for step two. We saw in the page 43 the need for power to deal effectively with our addiction. And here on page 62, the need for power to deal effectively with our unmanageability. More about that in our comments next week because it's crucial from my standpoint. A critical piece of knowledge and a more important piece of information. Going through Alcoholics Anonymous and going through life, I would keep saying to myself, it's got to be better than this. You know, <laughs> what, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. Why do I keep making the same mistakes over and over? And I'll tell you what, Herb, when I read these bedevilments here, it, it reminds me just like drinking. Yeah. When I was drinking, I'd say, I, I should know better. I'm not going to do that again. Right. And I meant it. Yeah. You know, and if I have like a bad attitude, you know, if I'm feeling fearful, if I'm, uh, you know, the victim with my wife, on and on and on and on, I don't like having those that type of attitude. And, right. you know, sometimes I can, you know, get by with it and it goes away. But other times I act out on it and I feel horrible afterwards saying, why am I doing this again? I don't want to be doing this again. I should know better the program. I should be further in the program than this. And, you know, Herb, it is about control, just what you said earlier, because I've always been a, a doer, you know, I'm highly motivated in everything I do. I'll read all the books you can give me, you know, I'll, I'll do all that work and I'll do it with a smile on my face. But really what it comes down to is I haven't given up that control. I, you know, I still think I'm powerful. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these bedevilments to me are just amazing because I'm hoping in all hopes, just like your book says that, you know, embrace this feeling of hopelessness, embrace this feeling of desperation. And I've felt that way the last few days, Herb. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I am just so thankful for this. And, you know, it's, it's just a really important step for me in my life. Well, I, I think it's a critical step for everybody. This particular portion is critical. Um, uh, each, each part is important. But for me, the discovery of this understanding of unmanageability as the spiritual malady broke open to me why Bill said we're not cured and that we do need a daily practice of inventory through step 10, of meditation through step 11, and of operating on principles, especially to be helpful or to contribute to our environment around us on a daily basis because it's the of it's the habituation of other centeredness that is the antidote to our self-centeredness mm -hmm. and by my self-will i can't heal my self-will <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I so, love that. I yeah. really do because I have, that's been exactly my story right there, Herb. Yeah. I'll take care of this. I'll yeah. fix it. I'll read this book. It'll never happen again. Exactly. I'll know better. Therefore, I'll do better. That's it. Yeah. Or I'll, I'll do some type of a self-developmental thing. Therefore, I'll even do better because now I know how to do better. That's right. And, and it's really a complete collapse conceding bill uses the term conceding on page 30 yeah we concede to our innermost self not just that we're powerless over alcohol but that we're actually powerless over our own willpower to be decent and healthy and whole human beings that i just absolutely need a power connection other than myself Otherwise, I'm always going to choose me. Yes. 
For sure. But I did want to ask you one thing. I thought I heard you say one time that that uh, unmanageability is the best kept secret in Alcoholics Anonymous and yes. that it is self-centeredness and the spiritual malady. Yes. And we'll okay. be talking the entire workshop next week. We'll be talking about that, that single phrase from the top of page 62 because it identifies the exact nature of the problem. Whereas today we've talked about bedevilments, which is a manifestation of the problem. We can see behaviorally what it looks like, but next week we're going to burrow down into the exact nature of it and identify why are we like this? Mm -hmm. what, what, what does it mean yeah. that, that we have these bedevilments and we're powerless over it? What does that actually mean? Boy, I sure want to know, Herb, so I'll be there. I'll be the first one on next Thursday, okay? okay? Wonderful. Yeah, it's, um, yeah it, it's, it bears a lot of work that we're doing and the emphasis that we're giving it. One of my favorite images that was given to me by a speaker at one point, and he said, you cannot make a flower grow by pulling on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Herb. My willpower um, has to be shut down. Really? Yes. Really? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. What does it mean by your willpower needs to be shut down? Because my willpower got me to, the, to AA. <laughs> yes. Self-will got me to AA. Mm -hmm. So, and that, so I understand no willpower of mine can ever work for me. Well, I mean, you're pretty hopeless if that's true. And I don't believe it for a minute. I believe that we do have free will. That's the whole basis of society and law and civilization, that we have free will. We make choices, we take actions, and we are responsible for them. But Bill is suggesting here, that we're not, there's, a, there's an aspect of our will that is not free, and that's what you're talking about. The aspect that you've seen that has been so counterproductive to you. Um, so I, 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 it may be that we're just using different words to express the same experience, but go ahead. That's it. So I can't rely on my will or my ideas or me. By themselves. Um. Are you no. saying that you're not responsible for your life? No, I'm not. Not till I got to AA, I was not responsible. Yes, you are responsible. Sorry. You are 100% responsible. Now, you couldn't have done any differently, but you're responsible for your drinking and you're responsible for your behavior, 100%. No, you I'm not. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Be because I was always a victim yeah, well, you tell that to the judge, you're going to jail. I don't have to go to a judge. I'm <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. That and so that am I. That you were, you I were. was not responsible from, from anything I did through self that was good for me. That, so self-will is, is relevant. It's, it's what? Rubbish. It's, it's rubbish. Self-will is rubbish. Mm. Well, um, so do you have any free will at all? Um, do I have any free will? Now, that's different from self-will. Um, yes, actually quite, quite different. So I do have free will, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the freedom of the will is to evaluate, do I want self-will to take over? Or do I want a uh, higher power's will to take over? Bam. That's exactly right. Yeah. A lot of people are not that, that conscious to be able to make that distinction. From my standpoint, that's the distinction that came to me during this process. Um, that although I don't have a response, I don't have free will when it comes to my addiction or even my behavior, that there was a lot of conditioned behavior that, I was a victim of conditioning, but, yes. that, but at the very heart of the heart of the heart, underneath everything, I still have a free will to choose my self-will or to choose God's will. Correct. 
correct. That's yeah, just, exactly. just like you said. Yeah. And, and that's really the point here of unmanageability is to see that and then to come into step two, choosing God. Yes. Yeah. 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 Turning away, standing at the turning point. Standing turning at the turning point, turning from that self-will yeah. to then God's turn. will, knowing that I can't even do that, but I need grace to do that. Yeah. And just to be, I don't have to do anything. I just have to be ready, be waiting, be patient, be tolerant, be loving. Yeah, and do a fourth step. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have to do something, see? Yeah. Yeah. Um, only when self-will or free will starts coming into play. That's right. That, that's when I have to do something. Yeah, yeah. Because I become irritable and discontented and 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 um, harm. I start harming others. See, Absolutely. and that's when. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So that's what I suspected that we were actually just using words just a little bit differently, but underneath it, we both had the same dynamic in, in, cause I'm, I'm in, I'm agreeing with from my experience, the way you're now phrasing it, or at least I'm the way I'm understanding your phrases. All right. Anything that's else? Right. Yeah. Oh, thank you for asking me to share. If I can't find a way to deal with the unmanageability it will, I, I, my first thought is always to self-medicate or to self-escape um, because right. it, it's like, I, there's one story in the big book where she talks about she was walking around thinking, not thinking, thinking, you know, trying to stop thinking, um, thinking, drinking, drinking, thinking, I think is how she says it. Um, and sometimes I just feel like I, if I could just stop thinking, I wouldn't pick up, yeah. but I can't. I can't, I've, I, I've gotten close, but I can't. Well, the, the point is not to stop thinking, it's to contain your thinking, to channel your thinking. You may be aware that I live in California, and you may be aware that we have some fires going on right now. Oh, yeah. Fires out of control are catastrophic, but fires in your fireplace and in your oven are wonderfully productive and effective. The difference is, a fire contained is helpful. Yes. Your mind contained and channeled. That's why Bill says we ask God to direct our thinking. That's why he says in, on the, in the same area, the proper use of the will is to use my free will to align myself with my understanding of God's will. If you want to be serene, find out, what is reality, and go with the flow. You adapt to reality. Reality never adapts to us. Yes. Yeah. And, and so when I'm in my recovery, when I'm in the solution, as we often say, um, the unmanageability for the most, it's, it's generally not there. I might have a day here or a it, moment it, there. It reduces the speed bumps, but the speed bumps are cyclical. Right. right. But see, Bill says in step 10, we're not cured. The real key here, and I'm trying to help everybody really make this connection, because it explains why he calls it a daily reprieve. We're not cured of unmanageability. It is with us. This self-will, it's our nature. Yeah. And it's only with a connection to God and grace that we can use our will correctly to be in alignment with reality. And we can only stay in alignment if we do 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis. That's the theory underneath the big book. Right. Yeah. So, so and, and that's what I say when I'm in the solution, when I'm working my steps, when I'm working the program, when I'm talking to my sponsor, when I'm making my outreach calls, it gives me what I need to live in reality. Yes. I want to, I always want to live in reality because I've recognized over 12 years what happens <laughs> when I don't. But the part that just really gets me is I am so powerless. I am so powerless 
to stay to 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 avoid all my flights of fancy to avoid my you know that's it my i just it's like even when things are good even when things are good i will start getting crazy in my head about wanting things to be different or better or why can't i do this or why can't i do that it never ceases to amaze me how much i can pull uh how does how do they say it? pull defeat from the jaws of success or something like that? All right, that's yeah. You mm-hmm. know, and so it's like the thing is, but it's so hard for me to. You know, you start feeling healthy, you start feeling good, yeah. and you think, well, now I can take charge. Now I can start. You know, I get to choose what job I have. I get to choose. Yeah. You know, what house to buy. And then I get in over my head and I start, and the unmanageability starts. And I feel like the only way that I maintain my peace and contentment is almost to just wake up and say, let just life happen. Just let life happen. I know that whatever happens, I'll be okay. So let's just let it happen. The moment I start planning something way far in advance and I just start getting attached to it, or if I just let myself be in the discontent because it's all around me. My head, it becomes the obsession that that thought instantly becomes that's the right. obsession. No, that's it. Because it creates the tension and the fallback position for addicts when we have tension is to find the thing that soothes our tension. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, that's exactly. exactly right. And that's why we, are encouraged to improve our consciousness on a daily basis so that we're aware of this um, and that we take responsibility for thinking and making decisions and the actions that come from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just taken me a really long time to realize that I'll be okay if I don't get my own way. Or that you redefine your own way as being much more the middle road in acceptance of reality is looking at unmanageability as part of step one. Because I understand it doesn't mean that I manage it. Because I understand it means that I have this deep experience, as you just said, I need a power other than myself to even cope reasonably with life. Right. Yeah. I have to have something that helps me cope with life because otherwise I'm an addict and I'm in something. I'm either in the food or I'm shopping or yeah. drinking. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm yeah. all. Just like whack-a-mole. Yeah. You, know, you, get the, you get control over the food. And in my case with uh, the men I sponsor, uh, they get control, they have abstinence in alcohol for 10, 20, 30 years, and they begin to have a food addiction, or they begin to have a pornography addiction, or they begin to have a work addiction, because it will pop out if you're not treating the unmanageability. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's been, I, I, I definitely am, have no, uh, have, have what am I trying to say? I have no delusion about that. <laughs> the minute yeah. I feel the unmanageability creep in, I know it's time yeah. to look at what's going on and talk to people because I know that it's a very short, short space, the short space for me between unmanageability, the yeah. obsession to soothe it, right. and then the bite. Well, and that's where Bill Wilson, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're having this dialogue because I'm hoping it's giving a big context to everybody else. But that's why Bill introduces step 10 as part of the way of life. When I'm disturbed, he doesn't say if, because we'll be regularly disturbed on a daily basis. When I'm disturbed, we pray because I'm powerless. But as you just said, we talk to somebody because we're human and we need that. Mm -hmm. And eventually we we attempt to try to help somebody else. That's the final piece in in that formula. That's the part that's hard for me. I'm still selfish with my time and I, I, I'm not super excited about doing a lot of service. Yeah. Well, maybe you need to challenge what does service mean for you? No, no, no. It, it may be that 
you're, you're not suitable or cut out to be or invited to be of service in the traditional sense. But until you become aware of and contributing to the environment around you, all right, you'll never be a whole and happy person. So what about environmental things? I'm rehabilitating some really trashed property where I bought a house. Well, but are you doing that to improve your financial worth? No, I'm doing that because my worms need food and my soil is terribly so, nutrient deficient. I, I think being aware of your environment and other people, I, uh, I have a friend who uh, hasn't been to, he's 35 years sober and he hasn't been to a meeting in 30 years. He has never had a sponsor. He did the steps in my workshop way back when, and he's got a powerful spiritual life. He sits in his office and he helps people with their relationships with the IRS and he does it pro bono most of the time. Oh, that's, I do, I do a lot of help for people in, in that. That's that. his what? service. That's his service. Hmm. Has nothing to do with AA, has nothing to do with addiction. It has everything to do with helping people. So I'm, I'm endorsing your orientation. You may not be called to service in the traditional sense, but it sounds to me like you're oriented to at least be aware of con contributing to the environment around you for fun and for free. You know, I have read the book, big book a hundred times, Herb, <laughs> but I feel like I am reading it for the first time. Um, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, it's really... It's amazing. I get so excited when I think about it. Yeah. I I am anxious to move on to I accept 100% my powerlessness, my inability to um rational rationalize the consequences of picking up um you know, I have that curious blank mental spot that, that, uh, anyway, I just, I want to get to the part where I'm saved. Uh, a lot of times over the past few weeks, I've said this before, I feel naked. I feel doomed. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't want to feel like that. I understand. Um, yeah. And then. I didn't understand what you were talking about, you, about your three teachers, the first two, and then the third one. What, what was the difference? I, I, I don't understand that. Like, um, I, I don't know. Herb, I'm showing up. I'm, I'm doing the work to the best of my ability, and I'm happy with that. I truly am. Um, um, I love the support I get, and... Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Pretty Sounds happy. Like you're having an excellent experience with it. To answer your question, the first two took me through a traditional way, the way the book is structured for step one. And that is, they made sure that I understood addiction, the problem of the body and the problem of the mind. Okay. But neither of them spent any time on unmanageability and glossed over it as if it should be already understood in the first half of the first step. And I didn't know any better, so I didn't have any perspective. So I just accepted the instructions as they gave them. But this third time, this man began to give me these instructions that I've been giving you and unpacking page 45, 44 and 45, and now 52, the way I just unpacked it to you, which was very different. When I, when I read out the bedevilments from page 52, what was your hearing and experience with that? I, I was absolutely bedeviled, I, and I had no idea why. Yeah. I kept trying to make good decisions and just getting in worse and worse trouble. That's it. My life just kept getting worse and worse. And I didn't, I thought I was sort of being punished. Yeah. Like I, I had no idea, no clue. No. Today, today I know pretty much, uh, you know, 
I am, but you know what? I am still bedeviled yes. at times. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm at my brother's house in New York. We just a huge wedding, a lot of personalities. And I can't tell you how many times I had to walk around the block. Sure. Because they bother me. Yeah. I am bedeviled. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the good news for me and them <laughs> is <laughs> that I know what to do. Well, that is really good news for you and for them. And it's also the example that really illustrates why Bill says we're not cured in step 10. Yeah. You see, addiction is a problem that is resolved in the big book by step nine. It says we're placed in a position of neutrality. The problem of addiction is removed but not the problem of unmanageability. And that's the point. What you're just describing, that's the human condition. Yeah, I am definitely human. But just, just one other thing, when I, when I first went to AA, I was not an alcoholic. I, I was just trying to get out of trouble. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Get invited to Thanksgiving. That's what I was. That's why I went to AA. <laughs> But I could identify with the unmanageability because I, there was so much wreckage in my life and I had no idea how to fix it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually my story too. I, I thought unmanageability was a problem of alcohol. And of course it is. But it's not the problem because alcohol was removed and at 10 years of sobriety, I still relate to unmanageability mm -hmm. like you did. Yeah. Do you have any experience of not doing what you want to do and, and doing what you didn't want to do? I have to say that to myself every single day. <laughs> because I wake up fine and I have a great breakfast and I have a great lunch. And then somewhere in the late afternoon the feelings of, you know, maybe I should treat myself and the heck with this. And there's a lot of conversation in my head for, um, with unmanageability. Absolutely. There you go. And then I say to myself, Herb said, <laughs> in the midst of this conversation, Herb said, and um, sometimes I follow it and do what I don't want to do. And sometimes I do what I don't need to do. There you go. See, you're and having an experience with unmanageability. And the unmanageability is there for the rest of the night in my mind, mm -hmm. in, my, in my behavior, in my language. It's all, um, I'm not pleasant to be around. Right. And so um, I do my, my ninth step and I, you know, review what I've done and who I've heard and whatever and ask for the, the um, strength for tomorrow yeah. and the ability to move away from my way of doing things and surrender my power. Or, or I'm, see, I'm, I don't believe that we surrender our power. I believe we surrender our do, will. We direct our power. All right. We say, God, what is your will? Thy will be done. With my free will, I'm making a decision to be in alignment with God's will. Right. And then it's not so unmanageable. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, well, in fact, by definition, you're beginning to be empowered to manage your life. I manage my life today. I, I have managed my life for 32 years. All right? Mm -hmm. In partnership with God, in partnership with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. On my own, I'd make a train wreck. Right. Right. Well, that's where I am, and... Um, so you're not, you're not confused at all. You're very clear. 
Well, I just got it as we were talking to yeah. me, believe it or not. I just yeah. Yeah. fell into line. I thought I had it all together before I got it all You know, line. exactly. Well, it was kind of like, uh, I'm going to give this example. When I worked with this, the, each of these men, it was like they put one of these miner hats on, these coal miner hats with the right. light in the front. Yes. And when they gave me instructions, it was like they clicked on the light and I was able to read the big book for the first time and understand it. Right. Yeah. Right. I've had some very significant changes happen through each workshop. And so now my focus is going to be on the SLAA program. I mean, I've done OA three or four times with you, you know, with the OA focus. And um, this is process addiction. Um, and in the SLAA program, they have what's called anorexia, people who, um, you know, like kind of longing to be in relationships, but don't are afraid to be in one. And um, I've, I've told this to you before her, but I've been single like 17 years and 15 years celibacy, which is very private, but I'm just saying it. And um, I got a sponsor in the program and I'm on my third step. Um, and sometimes when you ask questions, I, I wonder how can I tweak, for lack of a better term, some of the things that the big book have to do with me being afraid to be intimate or to let myself allow to date. I am clueless, right. but people in that program understand me. Yeah, no, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think your words are very straightforward and we, I really appreciate your courage and vulnerability. Um, so yeah, there, there, I don't believe there's any mystery in what you're saying. It's a very human phenomena taken to, of course, uh, the extreme of, as you're identifying it, some form of addiction. So, yeah. So I'm excited about this new discovery. And like the set aside prayer says, a new experience. Yeah, yeah. And the word <clears throat> I think that you were looking for when you were talking about exploring SLA with um, the big book is... Uh, adapted. You're adapting the instructions in the big book about alcohol to your particular area of concern. And that's an insight that I received after probably doing workshops for about five years, where multiple fellowships wanted to do the step work that I had originally just restricted to alcoholics. And after prayer meditation and counsel with sponsors, um, it was clear that uh, the, the steps would be for a spiritual awakening, regardless of what the presenting issue was. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, you've said this before, but it just hit me so powerfully when you said, the voice said to you, the small voice said, you are a bottomless pit and it will never be enough. That was so powerful to me mm -hmm. because I have the disease of more <laughs> and nothing is ever enough. And I would love to be at a place where I'm rid of that. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or living with it in acceptance rather than <clears throat> resisting it or feeling like it's something wrong with me. Actually, that hunger, that thirst, that longing in me is my humanity calling me to be in connection with power other than myself. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I become addicted to people, to a person, a person, um, male or female, it makes no difference. Uh, I was in love with someone for 10 years who happened to be gay. I've had crushes on teachers starting at six or seven years old. And um, I become fixated on a person and I can't let go of them. I'm powerless, powerless to let go.
It's been all through my life. I have it now with someone. It's embarrassing to talk about. I, I don't know how to get over it. And you just said to the other lady, well, why don't you accept it? And just make that a part of who you are. Because it, when it happens, it rules me. Mm-hmm. I do things I don't want to do, like go see that person or be available to that. I, I wasn't actually suggesting accepting the addiction in its negativity. I was, exce- I was suggesting, ex- I'm so glad that you are helping us refine this uh, comment that I made. I, I'm really talking about accepting the underneath, underlonging uh, tension that comes from that, that this is just part of my human nature. Um, so are you in a 12-step program dealing I, with this? No, I'm in FA. I'm, I also have a food addiction. Well, that's a 12-step program. Yeah, I'm in a 12-step oh. program. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but not like dealing it. with this particular no. addiction. No. And have you uh, done the steps before? Only once when I lived in Boston many, many, many years ago. Right, and um, as a result of doing those steps, what was your experience? So long ago. I felt good at the time, but, um, you know, this addiction has plagued me since I was a little girl. Yeah. So, 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 no, wait, 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 wait. You're answering my question. If right now you cannot remember what your experience was because it was such a long time ago, you didn't have one. Probably not. Yeah. So it's okay, though. Because now with this work that you do here, you will have an experience. It won't be by next week or by next month. But by the time we finish the fifth step, you're going to go, holy shit, I have really missed it up till now. But now, thank God, I've had this experience. I hope so, Herb. Yeah, that's my promise to you. Yeah. Because it it has hurt me a lot. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. With self judgment, self hate. Sure. And what am I doing this for? Why am I riding over there? She does, uh, he does nothing but insult me. And yet I go back for more. And it's horrible. Yeah. Right, right. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. So. And so are you participating in the assignments as we're unfolding them? Yes. All right. Mm hmm. Remember last week I spoke to you, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. About what? <laughs> About I said when I said it, you were mean. Oh, yeah. No, no. I've been told by experts. Oh, I'm no expert, but I said it too. <laughs> I, I, now I'm remembering the conversation. Somehow you look different right now, but uh, I, I am uh, remembering the conversation. It was a wonderful, candid conversation. No, mm-hmm. I have um, a personality that brings me to be very, dire- I call it being very direct. Some people tell me I'm rude. Mm-hmm. I, um, I try not to be mean. I try to be kind. I try to be considerate. But I pretty well do not polish my words or the truth as I see it. I don't always see, obviously, reality as it is, but I've got an awful lot of experience now. And I, I, don't, put, I don't have much tolerance for whitewashing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I try, to put the, I try to put my iron fist in a velvet glove. Sometimes um, the glove is not so cushiony. All right. I appreciate it. You stay with us and continue applying these assignments. You'll find that it's going to give you a completely new perspective on on your life and on life in general. Okay. Yeah. Thank Thank you so much. I feel like my perception with reality has been off for my whole life. And now it's, um, and I think that's why I had a hard time surrendering with the food. Um, And I think that's why, you know, I read that bedevilment thing that we did and I did it in the first person, like you said, you know, I had a hard time, you know, in personal relationships and I had a hard time making a living and I had a, and the reason 
I feel that I had a hard time with each one of those bullet points on the bedevilments is because I was not living in reality. So I couldn't have a personal relationship with the guy, you know, who was good to me and a good person and, you know, had my back because I was, you know, trying to sleep with rock stars and, you know, be <laughs> years younger than I was. And, you know, and I thought one day someone's just going to discover me and realize what a talent I am and I'm going to be famous and a Kardashian and life will be great. Right. Um, but I was in full flight from reality. And it's like, I get that thing when he says, you know, you, 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 get into reality and I'm paraphrasing and, and you find it beautiful. There's something about like, you find reality beautiful because it's almost like I can just relax now and just be in what is it's helping me so much in so many areas of my life. Wow. Um, I'm curious because quite frankly, it's early in the process for you to be having such a profound insight. So tell me a little bit about, what brought you to having this kind of a curtain parting uh, awareness? Um, I think I've kind of been like, like priming myself for it for years. You know, I've been, I've been seeking spirituality and me I've done everything, you know, transcendental meditation and, you know, in different churches and different, I mean, I've been baptized in every church you can imagine and just always seeking just a hunger for God, for a connection with God. And the food was really the last thing blocking me. I have over 30 plus years off of drugs. I had a spiritual, I had a spiritual white light experience, quit drugs, never went back, never even went to program, just stopped. Wow. Yeah. But, but the spiritual experience um, or the awakening wasn't happening because I wasn't around the information in order to have the awakening. So yeah. I think it's that, and I think I've relapsed so many times in program, um, and I what really program? in see how in in food programs, it. and I bounce back and forth between. I used to bounce back and forth between OA and see how, but I know see how is the right program for me. I need the structure and the and the you know the format. But what I was going to say is that with the food, I think with within the relapsing. I got when you said there's a force in me that just doesn't have my best interest at heart or something in me. I want recovery, but what happens? <laughs> you know, it's like, what happens? And when you said the thing about the mind, it's like, oh, there's something working against yeah. what I want. That's and, right. if, and as long as I can identify that, I'm powerless to change it. I'm powerless to do anything, but I know where to go for power i know where to where to seek because i've been doing that my whole life yeah and and that's a wonderful awareness and what i didn't know even when i was doing the steps the second first and second time I really didn't know that these steps are in fact the process that brings us and delivers us to power. I knew that by the time I was doing it the third time, but not as clearly as when I finished it that third time, because that third time I realized that my concept of power, my concept of God, the traditional spiritual stuff that I had was the very impediment to the reality that you're talking about. Mm. I had knowledge and I had fantasies, but I didn't have reality. Right. And the third time through the steps, the curtain finally did part and I saw that a power is available and I can establish an authentic relationship with it. Yeah. Like I kind of got the allergy of the body the first time I went through, you know, I got it. Like I understand I once I started, I don't want to stop can't stop, don't want to stop. But, but the mind, I didn't really understand. I just really thought powerlessness was, of course, I'm powerless. I just ate, you know, a, a vat of whatever, but that wasn't it. That wasn't, you know, and unmanageability, I didn't really understand too. I thought my life was unmanageable because I was binging. Right. And, and it is because you were binging, but that's not the real connotation or meaning of uh, unmanageability, which we'll unpack in uh, at a new level next week. 
Yeah, it's just I'm getting so much out of it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yep. You know, last night I did a meeting and I was crying on the meeting, and that's just not something I would have allowed myself to do before because, you know, I couldn't let anybody see that I wasn't having this perfect recovery. You know, at three or four years in the program, that I wasn't, you know, better basically. Right. Right. And you know, and that recovery means that I should be able to A, B, and C as opposed to you know, just accepting where I'm at and what I'm up to and, yeah. and all of that sort of thing. So, and, and accepting where you're at doesn't mean it's a passive rollover. Oh, that's just the way I am. Oh, that's just the way life is. No, 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 no. This is about the acquisition of power. In fact, in step 10 on page 85, Bill says, this is the proper use of the will. Our will is to say, thy will be done. Meaning, I want reality to be an awareness in my part so that I can live in alignment with that reality. Reality doesn't respond to my expectations. Mm. Reality just is what reality is. It's my yeah. job to figure it out and then to adapt and adopt into reality. But it doesn't mean that I'm passive and just going to sit on my couch and watch the movie. Not at all. Mm. That's why I mean, that. preaching to the choir here, because all of you are here, you're engaged in this work. So you're clearly not passive, but I, I want to make sure the word surrender is a very active word. Mm. It's an admission and a conceding of complete defeat. But another definition is to join the victorious. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Right. I have one question about the bedevilments. Yes. The one that says um, we couldn't control our emotional nature. Mm. And I'm kind of confused by the word control. Okay. Um, I don't know um, what the antidote to that is. I mean, I know the antidote for most of this is, is a, a connection to a higher power, but our emotional natures, that happened to me tonight because someone pointed out that I'm always late. Mm. So very passively aggressive. I said, well, you're always early. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's okay. <laughs> but, um, and what I was defending, it's, it's that old thing of uh, it's why I lie. It's because I feel, I don't feel good about myself in a really poor level and I'm afraid that I am going to be abandoned and left alone and nobody will want to be with me if they know all my flaws. Mm. Yeah. You know? yeah, I do. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was kind of uh, amazing. Mm. <laughs> I got to look at that yeah. right away. So I think I owe that person immense, but um, you yeah. Know. So, you, you, hmm? know. You, you probably don't. I don't. Uh, no. Um, well, did you harm that person? I don't know. No, they ignored you. They did? They're not that important. Uh, mm. Okay. That's what my step guide told me when I felt guilt or shame about some of my behavior. He said, for some of your behavior, you are guilty and you should be ashamed. But most of it is just your oversensitivity mm -hmm. for looking worse than you want to be seen as. You're not right. harming anybody. Yes. It's harm, harm is the eighth step, not your behavior. The negative impact of your behavior on other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So don't be overly, how do you say, scrupulous. Although be responsible for the potential income impact of your behavior, that's all. I am always 
have a fear of impending doom. I wake up in the morning, it's... <clears throat> right. I wake so, so that's what we mean by unmanageable. Why don't you get rid of your fear? Um, I, I don't know how. It, oh, I don't, you mean you can't manage it? I cannot manage it, yeah. So this is what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So talk more about your um, uh, grapple, your grapple with the uh, unmanageability. Um, I believe at this point in my life, my life is manageable by the grace of God. So, so you always do what you want to do and you never don't do what you don't want to do. No. I buy things that I don't want to buy. Well, why, buy don't you, why don't you manage that? And that, that's the simplest way that I approach unmanageability is I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. Okay. I mean, that's as simple as it kind of gets. It's kind of like, I, I, I know better. I just don't do better. Sometimes I don't even know better. And therefore, don't do better. Can we do better as we increase our conscious contact with a power greater than ourselves? Is that a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know that at some point I'm going to be okay. Yes, no, but that's the whole point. Step 11 really captures it sought through prayer and meditation to improve our consciousness. And how does it end? Praying for the knowledge of God's will, and then praying for the power to do it. We need both knowledge and power. I've had plenty of knowledge, I just haven't been able to put it into my feet. Okay. Yeah. And, and stay with us because next week we'll be unpacking the other half of um, this assignment. Right now we're looking at the approach of the will that Bill talks about on pages 44 and 45. And then on 52, what does it look like behaviorally, those bedevilments? Okay. That's why I ask you to make it personal and make it present in the present tense today as you did and try to sort out what, what, which ones of these apply to me today. And you went through the list and you saw at least one of them was very relevant about fear. Well, that just shows you that somehow you're not spiritually fit in that area. Not overall, but in that area. And Bill on page 68, if you have an interest in looking at his top comments on fear, he says, we have fear because we don't rely on God. We rely on ourselves. I mean, it's, it's, it's glib, but it's also wonderful wisdom, very deep wisdom. To the extent that we trust God, really, our fear is totally reduced. The, the, if we trust reality and really, really understand what reality is, we will have serenity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Herb. I have questions about the... Um evening prayer and meditation format. There's two words on there. And I've always been curious about, I, I know what the words mean. One is forgiveness and one is dishonesty. But I wonder if you could, okay, where it's at on the evening one. Uh, do I owe an apology? Have I kept something to myself? And right after those, ask God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And 
I wonder if you'd speak to that a little bit, because I, I think, well, if God made us this way, why am I asking him for forgiveness? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. It's a really good question. It's a real, it, it's, um, it's, my sense is it's Bill not really being very careful with the use of his words there. He's more using sort of religious traditional phrases that he would have picked up from the Oxford group. Oh. All right. So having said that, though, I've done an awful lot of work in the area of forgiveness. And number one, I was asked to look it up in a dictionary. You may or may not have done that. But I'm suggesting if anybody's interested in pursuing this conversation, look up the word forgiveness in a dictionary. Now watch my hand. I looked up the word in the dictionary and it said a decision to release them. Mm. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. It made the whole process very understandable and simple to me. Like the Lord's Prayer, forgive them their debts to the extent that we are, we are forgiven our debts to the extent that we forgive them their debts. Releasing. And the, oh. yeah. and the mm, Prayer of St. Francis, we are forgiven to the extent that we forgive them. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, the release, my experience with steps four through nine is that's the turning that allows us to see that holding on to resentments is not of any value to myself or anybody else, but I need to be released from them. This process releases us. In step nine, where we've harmed other people. That's, I'm so clear on the difference between my behavior and the harm in step eight. Um, my behavior causes the harm. My behavior is not the harm. But I did cause harm. And how do I repair that damage? How do I he bring healing to that? By certainly acknowledging it, and perhaps in some compensatory way, uh, balancing the scale of justice. So my sense of the process of forgiveness is it starts with step four. It ends with step nine in a very intentional way where we bring healing to other people because of the negative impact of us in their lives. And in bringing that healing to other people, we ourselves by byproduct are healed. Does that make sense to you? That makes absolute sense. I think what I'm wondering is why am I asking God's forgiveness? No, that was your original question, and I have no answer to that because God doesn't forgive us. God doesn't forgive us. No. Because there's nothing to forgive because we're human? Damn, absolutely. That's what my confusion was. Yes, Thank and, you. and rightly so, and rightly so. My understanding of this whatever this reality is, we have a symbol called G-O-D. It's yeah. unconditional love. Yes. Unconditional love. There's no conditions. It just loves me into existence and it loves me in supporting me in existence. So this was just sort of a communication at that time based on what his experience was. Yeah, and 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 the and the sort of the vocabulary of the Oxford group and the Christian religion that time and and today, I mean, people in yes. the religion still talk that way. Thank you. My other one was about dis. I know what dishonesty is. Well, what is it? But well, I've lied. I've stole. I mean, technically, but I've always wait, 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 been technically. Listen to your. Uh, logical uh, parsing of the words. Ooh, how we protect our ego. Uh, Here's my definition of dishonesty, misrepresenting reality. But I feel like there's a subtlety of that in this. Tell me about it. 
I was hoping you'd tell me because I'm very oh, confused. No, no. You're the one that brought up the question. No, no. You're the one that's pretending to be confused. You're not one bit confused. You just don't want to be honest. If I'm being dishonest in the way it's being said here. Well, how is it being said there? I, I don't know, but I th what I suspect it's meaning is if I'm perhaps trying to look like I don't need help, would that be dishonest? If you do need help, then it is dishonest, yes. If you don't need help, then it's very honest when you say, I don't need help, thank you very much. Misrepresenting reality, either internally or externally. Bill says that in chapter five, rigorous honesty is a, almost a requirement of this program. Rigorous honesty. My sponsor used the word sp uh, transparent. I, I, see, honestly, I, I'm not saying I don't do it. I'd like to identify it when I'm doing it. And I think I have a, I'm not understanding it very well. You're not understanding I know that's... what? No, you're being very vague here. I think because it's so vague for me, the, <laughs> the meaning of it. And you need to get clarity because it's dishonest to live in the fog. And to say, oh, I just don't understand it. Oh, yeah? Well, get over yourself and start to understand it. I'm trying to. No, um... no, no, that wasn't directed at you. I'm sorry. That was not directed at you. That was uh, talking just generally about what I, how I approach it with people. Could you give me an example, like no, a more esoteric no, you, one? No, 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 you give me an example. It's your question. You oh said that you're confused. What are you confused about? I'm not confused. <laughs> that's why I want you to make it easy on me and tell me what it is. Oh, maybe that's dishonest. Mm. I'm smarter than that. I'm way smarter than that. I could look at it closer. And I want you to do it for me. Is that dishonest? Oh, well, you tell me. It, when, it when you feels immature. Work, when you want me to do your work for you, you just called it immature. And that's probably true. But it's just totally dishonest. You're quite capable of figuring this out. If you were honest, it might be a different okay. question. I, okay. I, I talk to my sponsor or step guide or therapist or good friends, a, a whole s a group of people um, yeah. when, when I'm not clear about something. And, but I talk about my lack of clarity. Where is it coming from? I own it myself. And me wanting you to give me an example is me not owning it. And that's dishonest. Well, I would. You don't have to push it. I mean, I I wouldn't. Uh, you know, you're being dishonest. No, I I can hear sponsors get, getting all over that as judge and jury. Yeah, I don't like right. that at all. But, but it's essentially yes, dishonest. And what is denial? Denial really is a dishonesty with myself. Now, sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's unconscious. I didn't yeah. know that I didn't know. Yes. But I nevertheless was being dishonest, even if it was unconscious. With this thing, I almost feel that. I don't know what I don't <laughs> that's know. That's why I went there with the conversation. Yeah. I'm, I'm confident that's true. Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. Okay. Well, that, that was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. But, um, and you probably asked the question for lots of other reasons, because I think there's more unpacking for you to do there. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I hear people in this kind of conversation talk about a white lie. There's no white lies. That's just dishonest. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It's no, very it's helpful. Great. It's a great question setting us up for some future work. That's great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I've been married to the same man 43 years. I live in the same house 47 years. I don't like change. And um, so... I you... understand that. And, and, uh, and yet, when I approached this process with the set-aside prayer, I was changed.
I, I was married 52 years and lived in our family home for 45 years. I had the same career for 42 years. I don't like to be either, but I like, I now know that I like to be changed because the direction is very healing. And the direction is getting me to a place that I could not get to on my own because I didn't even know it existed. Yeah, I've had those experiences and I am very excited to, you know, be in this process and to put in this time and to look forward to it. And I know there are, you know, uh, miracles beyond my wildest expectations. In fact, if you want me to stay with anything, gifts tell me you're going to give me a present or a miracle, I'll be there. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about the miracles that go on and they do. And I don't care how really big or small they are. They, you know, each little change is a blessing. Well, try to make this as personal about you as you're willing to do and see what happens. And the other thing that I would like to say is that I was really bothered by you being called mean, uh, because <laughs> uh, mean, mean, you know, I've been called mean, and mean is one of the worst adjectives that anybody can call me. Oh. And it, it really digs deep into me, and I felt very defensive for you, and... Um, but you see, I... I... I did not have a problem with it. You had a problem with it. I understand so you did. Don't make your problems my problem. I'm not making my problem your problem. I just felt like uh, it was one of the most graceful moments I've seen you. And I, I want to be like that. I want to be graceful when somebody calls me mean. And, you know, come back with them. Well, thank you. Not thank you, bitch, but thank you. Uh, you know, and, and be okay, and be okay. That's with great. No, we have to have a sense of humor here. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's wonderful. We do, and I do really, really appreciate that dogged kind of patience you have, and the honesty that you come back with, um, and, and it's so important. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the time we have today. We'll pick it up next week. So. Uh, Let's bring ourselves to conclusion with that serenity prayer. As I mentioned, it's the prayer of influence. It's a recognition. I have no control outside of me, inside of me. No control, but I have influence. That's my free will. It's, it's the pivotal conversation. Where is my will free? And I do have responsibility. And where is my will not free and I have no choice? We're going to be talking a lot about that next week. Please join me in that serenity prayer, which is a prayer for wisdom, that gift of knowledge, that gift of grace that can, gives us an experience. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Thanks, everybody.